recording. Two, one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to uh, Ask Me Anything Fridays. This is uh, Carlos Leva, your host for the next half hour or so. The uh, topic that we're going to talk about if we don't get enough questions is accounting for disclosures, reading the tea leaves. That's what we started um, last time. I'm going to quickly go through, um, well, first of all, I'm going to ask Martin, does anybody have a pressing question out there? that they want to ask. We actually prefer to take, you don't have to have questions about accounting for disclosures. It can be, it's ask me anything. So if you got a pressing question, anything high tech HIPAA related, then I, I would rather take questions than, um, than go through the slides, but we can, we will go through the slides um, to, to an attempt to generate some questions uh, if we need to. So let me just ask Martin. No, we don't have any questions at this point in time. Okay, I'm going to quickly go try to get us caught up to where we went, got to last time. But uh, the accounting for disclosures is something, uh, maybe it's the one last big thing that has not been finalized under the High Tech Act, although it, it exists today in, in a certain form, uh, in, in the form that it's existed since um, the privacy rule actually went live um, to mix a, a software term with a legal term when it was promulgated and, and took effect in 2004. Uh, so there's current regulations around disclosures, and we'll get into a, a definition of what a disclosure is. High tech actually changed that in, in a dramatic way. Uh, HHS proposed a rule uh, in a uh, NPRM notice of proposed rulemaking back in, I, I, you know, it, it's been like, I think it was back in 2010, so it's been a long time now. Recently, in December, there was a tiger team of industry thought leaders that kind of pushed back because the industry, although in general has kind of freaked out about the High Tech Act, it really freaked out about accounting for disclosures, and there's a reason why. And so finally, we'll talk about uh, the road ahead. And this is going to be a, the complete hour of uh, the content here really makes up the complete hour of content that we have for next week's um, webinar. So if you want to catch this show, the AMA show on Friday, then you go to store.hippasurvivalguide.com, use that HTML, that's where you can find the registration, and that's our store. You click, get to our store, you get to newsletters, uh, click there, uh, and if you just remember the Hippo Survival Guide website, you can click on the store, and if you take these, it'll take you back to this, you know, uh, the news URL. It'll take you to this particular URL here. Um, okay, so where are we today? What does the disclosure mean? Well, it means the release, transfer, provisioning of access to or divulging in any manner of information outside of the entity. Notice that there, aren't, there are no exceptions built, uh, built into the definition. If you... Um, uh, uh, disclose, right? If you if you share this information outside of the entity, uh, and of course we're talking about uh, protected health information, even though that PHI is not uh, is not um, built into the definition. This is a definition from 160.103. It's really quite broad. So here are some examples. So if PHI is moved from a provider to an HIE, a health information exchange, that's a disclosure. If PHI is sent to uh, an entity to facilitate e-prescribing, e uh, you know, that's a, that's a disclosure, going, going to Walgreens or CVS. If, if it's shared for payment, if it's shared for treatment, those are all disclosures, okay? It, almost anything you can think of where you share PHI outside of the entity is going to be a disclosure. That's pretty broadly defined. So the current, this is the current regulation, 164.528, accounting, I like to say accounting for disclosures. I just take exception with, um, you know, accounting of disclosures, but that's just me. So I'll, 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 you'll hear me say accounting for disclosures or A4D for short. And it says, and this has been, this is the privacy rule that's been in effect now since 2004 or so, right? It's been in effect 10 years. An individual has a right to receive an accounting of disclosures, a PHI, made by a covered entity in the six years prior to the date on which the accounting 
is requested except for disclosures and then you have this laundry list of exceptions well the biggest one by far is the TPO exception treatment payment and operations because um, you know by far I believe the lion's share of disclosures that go on in day-to-day uh, 24-7 -day, 365 in the US healthcare industry have to do with treatment payment and operations and those were excluded under the prior rule so you just didn't have to do them right so it, it, in some ways 164.528 in its current state was much to do about nothing it's like huh is the question though when you start actually thinking harder about what does this mean if you were to get a request uh, and you'll see why um, my assertion is that accounting for disclosures is a monster and that's I'm trying to get you to understand how big a deal this could uh, turn out to be and sort of to understand the contours of A4D so that you are um, at least prepared um, you know in understanding your edu your literacy level at least has been raised as to what uh, this could mean here's the challenge here's the thing that's not immediately um, noted primarily because there's been so few requests industry-wide ever for accounting for disclosures almost no organizations have really had to deal with this in any meaningful sort of way but as soon as you start looking at what the requirements are the daunting and the immediate challenge to recognize is how do you separate what you must provide from the exceptions in your organization's audit logs the, the accounting for disclosures is that you, you, you look at your uh, audit logs and your information systems and you provide information regarding the disclosure. So how do you sort through that mess and say, okay, this one is good, this one is an exception, et cetera. It's, it turns out it's just a manual process for the reasons that uh, we're going to discuss. So one of the premises in HHS's um, proposed rule and, and, and what the High Tech Act talked about directly was really that these disclosures it, it appear would be coming from um, EHR systems but for a number of reasons um, that is not really self-contained because there's PHI outside of it that could come into play uh, and therefore EHRs really represent one of several if not many applications that a C or B, a C E or B A may have that contain PHI requiring tracking for disclosures. Now we're going to see uh, in a little bit here that under the High Tech Act, and if you have an EHR, the TPO exception has been removed, and that's the big deal. That's what caused the industry to really freak out. Is High Tech says, "Oh no, if you have a, an EHR." then you have to provide, you have to account for disclosures of treatment, payment, and operations. They are not excluded. And it's going to remain mostly a manual process, despite the fact that EHRs may produce the lion's share of the disclosure content um, going forward. And the fact that it's a manual process and will remain a manual process is really the other thing that um, that providers are really fearful of is, you know, how is this how can you build a process that scales if you get more and more patients asking for disclosure? So why hasn't it been a big deal previously? Because the monster has remained hidden because the number of accounting requests have been negligible. Okay, so this is just something like this ticking time bomb out there. And if you have more people requesting access to their PHI, more people requesting um, amendments to their PHI, a general education that this information is available by privacy groups, you are sooner or later you're going to have and likely have an increase of uh, requests for accounting for disclosures although as a practical matter that really remains to be seen just how big that number can get so 164.528 is is the section there are other if you had to deal with one that's where you go there are other uh, parts of this that if law enforcement asks you to suspend you got to suspend if you um, um, well, first of all, the, the accounting for disclosures uh, includes disclosures by BAs of the covered entity. 
Okay, so it's not just the covered entities disclosures, it's uh, uh, business partners disclosures as, as well. And here's the really daunting part, and this is the part that prevents any kind of real automation right now, is the accounting must include for each disclosure the date of the disclosure, the name of the entity or person who received the PHI, a brief description of the PHI, like an English language description of what this is, not the PHI itself. Now, you're not disclosing what PHI was disclosed. You're disclosing information about the PHI that was disclosed and a brief statement of the purpose of the disclosure. Now, here's the thing. Who has audit logs today with this information available? And the answer is no one does. No one has the purpose and all these things that are required. That kind of information is not being tracked in audit logs, even from industry-leading uh, EHR vendors. And so it's a manual process. And, you know, for a lot of you that are in small to medium-sized practices and you haven't even done your first risk assessment, you probably don't even know exactly which audit logs you would look at and because you don't have an inventory of all your applications and you wouldn't know where to start. Now, I'm going to you know, assert that you should get started. This is coming, but the, fir the first start is to do that inventory of a risk assessment that you probably haven't done because that at least gives you a clue where you might go look for audit logs and how you might be able to produce this information manually if you had to. Uh, if you have multiple disclosures to the same person or entity, you can summarize some of it. Uh, if you have disclosures regarding research, you, you can, and it's 50 or more individuals, you can talk about the protocol instead of other stuff. But these are really specialty items within uh, 164.528, and 164.528 has the same kind of uh, due process requirements as other sections of the Patient's Bill of Rights in that you have to provide the disclosure no later than 60 days after the receipt of the request from the patient. You can get a one-time extension of 30 days if you ask for it in writing. Um, and you have to provide, and you, you have to ask for the extension and provide reasons why there's a delay. And the first accounting in any 12-month period is free. Okay, so some of the basic due process requirements are built into uh, 164.528. You have to have the titles of persons or offices responsible for receiving and processing requests. This is really a um, set of requirements that are almost consistent across the patient's bill of rights that um, is section 164.520 that begins with the notice of privacy practices through 164.528. This 30 days, this written request of delay, this title of persons. So, you know, one of the things you should be doing is identifying who in the organization is saying it's similar to uh, uh, requests for access to PHI or requests for amendments to PHI. Are you logging the request? Are you logging the request? Have you trained individuals in your organization to manage the request? Are you meeting all the documentation requirements? I mean, these things need to be in place for all of the patient's bill of rights and, you know, certainly as well for a request for uh, a disclosure. So there are some things, some basic things that you ought to have in place because you need them anyway, uh, and, and they apply to accounting uh, for disclosures as well. And here's the real question. If, what would you do if you received 100 PHI disclosure requests this month? Well, the likelihood of this is, is not high. Because historically, there's been very few, but if it changes for whatever reason, and you're a small to medium-sized practice, this would probably um, grind your compliance requirement to a, a halt. Because you have 100 requests, you have 60 days, you may not even know which applications to go look in, and you're, you know, your hair is on fire trying to figure out how you're going to actually um, satisfy this requirement. So. Uh, so let me ask a question. Anybody just show of hands, how many people have ever dealt with uh, five or more uh, disclosure requests? Anybody? Nobody yet, but sometimes it takes a little while for the hands to go up. 
Okay, and now we have a very small group, so this is really a small sample, but let me just ask how many, uh, if anybody has dealt with one request. And let me further ask how many people are we even aware of this requirement and have processes in place to help deal with it if they did get a request? We have one hand. Okay, so. Uh, two hands, two hands. And now I've asked so many questions, we don't know which, which ones they're answering to, but uh, hopefully a few of you have some processes in place. That's, that's the place where you start. Okay, here is how the High Tech Act changed the accounting for disclosures. Okay, it's High Tech Act Section 13405, um, and uh, it's actually a, a small part of 13405 that is accounting of certain protected health information disclosures and it's really 13405C and because this is modifying uh, 164.528, the existing rule that we just looked at, um, and it's sort of, sort of a, a little difficult to read because it's replacing text, it says the, the exception under paragraph a1i shall not apply to disclosures through an electronic health record. Essentially what what this um, 13405C1A is doing is removing the TPO, the treatment payment and operations exception for the accounting of disclosures under 164.528. If you have an electronic health record, that exception no longer applies. Okay, and that's a really, really big deal because TPO includes hundreds of, uh, or thousands maybe, even for a small and medium-sized practice, thousands of disclosures a month. Uh, and it changes the time period if you have an EHR from, uh, for, for, um, uh, from six years to three. Okay, so those are two major things that the High Tech Act does to the accounting for disclosures. And here's the big one, is that there's no TPO exception. That just disappeared. It just when, uh, and this is obviously, you know, this is the thing that really caused uh, a, a panic am among uh, chief medical officers, CIOs, etc. This is a, this is a very big deal. So, you know, the question is, whoa, whoa, whoa what? Come on. Uh, so, there are other parts of um, Section 13405C, and one of them said that, you know. Um, HHS was uh, was tasked with developing some guidelines that should account for the interest of individuals and take into account the administrative burden. Burden, and uh, as you can tell, we we're in 2014. The High Tech Act came out in 2005. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2009. Um, you know, we're five years out, and uh, HHS has yet to provide a final rule because this is you know, could really have a lot of unintended consequences and, you know, they've been slow walking this thing. Um, but I think the time is drawn near where they're going to have to uh, come up with some sort of balancing act. Now, the proposed rule was an attempt for it by HHS to come up with a balancing act. There was, there was significant industry pushback in the form of the Tiger team. And so uh, HHS, after the December 2013 meeting, where the Tiger team reported out, I think essentially has gone back to um, the drawing board on this. So the other thing that 13405 says is that the covered entity can provide uh, all the disclosures or the covered entity can, uh, for additional disclosures, provide the patient with a list of business associates and the patient can go out and contact those business associates to get the disclosures. Obviously you know, patients aren't going to be um, happy with that, um, and covered entities probably are really not happy with having to disclose all their business associates' disclosures, so um, it's potentially a mess right now, but what 13.0405, and here to be clear, the High Tech Act is already law, so this, this is law today. This is 164.528 has already been modified, okay? The fact that HHS hasn't uh, come, up, come up with its final rule, doesn't mean that it's not law, probably means that HHS won't enforce it, but what if you had a major breach? What if you had another reason, if you had a patient complain about you not providing disclosures and you were thinking that, well, because HHS hasn't pr pr 
provide the final rule, I don't have to do this, and you would be wrong on all counts because it's been law for a while. The High Tech Act is already law, and you would have to, in the interim, come up with some sort of solution where you could satisfy that request or potentially risk uh, a complaint to HHS that on its face might look like willful neglect uh, because you were unaware that you had to uh, meet this requirement. And we've already seen that Cignet got fined $4.3 million um, for not providing um, PHI to about 41 patients, essentially denied them access to their PHI. Well, you know, Cignet is, is not the best of examples because they were went out of business and they, they essentially went rogue, you know, but it is, but they were huge. It is an example of what willful neglect may look like. If you, and if you just out of inadvertence or um, just not up to speed on, on the regulations, if you got, you know, a hundred, if you got that 100 request for whatever reason and thought you could just deny it because uh, the uh, final rule hasn't been promulgated by HHS, you would be wrong. So. Okay, there are various effective dates uh, in play here, um, and some of these effective dates have already come and gone, so it remains to be seen what uh, HHS is likely to do. There was an effective date of this rule if you got an EHR before uh, 2009. There was one if you got one after 2009. It, it could be deferred as far as, uh, as, far as 2016, but in the... Um, in the proposed rule in 2010, HHS did not defer, the, the, did not exercise uh, discretion or their authority to defer these dates. So I'm going to stop there. Does anybody have questions? We don't have any questions at this point. Okay, so the proposed rule, um, you, you guys need to come up with questions because if you don't come up with questions, we're going to stop doing these radio shows because they're really just a mini webinar. But you know, so if you got a pressing question about anything, it could be about a BA agreement. Uh, you know, we prefer to take the questions. But here's the big thing in the proposed rule: there are uh, the proposed rule is an accounting of disclosures and this thing called an access report. So the proposed rule adds a brand new right, a right to an access report that didn't exist before, and it adds it for uh, various reasons. It's, it's HHS's attempt to deal with this monster in a way that, in its opinion, would lessen um, the impact. And in fact, the Tiger team pushed back pretty hard, and I'm, I'll push back even harder in different areas to show what... Um, why there may be a ticking time bomb here. So the first is a, the first standard is a right to an accounting for disclosure that looks like um, you know 564 164.528, but they they talk about a designated record set. Okay, notice that in this standard, it's right. It's got nothing. It doesn't say anything about a, a EHR. It's a des designated record set by a CE or BA made in three years prior. So they they limit the time to a, to three years instead of six. And instead of having a bunch of exceptions where disclosures don't apply, uh, the proposed rule has a list here of where it does apply. Any disclosures not permitted by the privacy rule have to be accounted for. Any for public health, et cetera, et cetera. There's, so that, that's one big difference. You don't have an exception list. You have, hey, it applies here. But um, it also comes with a new set of exceptions. But if you look back, here, TPO is not accepted. There is no um, there is no TPO exception here. Okay, they don't mention TPO at all. So um, now they mention TPO later, but so it looks like um, it looks like in fact. This should read TPO is accepted because it's not part of this list that says what you can do. So when you're talking about disclosures, okay, um, 
and this is really confusing the way they went about it. So if you if you're ever interested in the sausage making, this is something. This is really really a prime example of bad sausage making because they keep what the, the rule that they've come up with is really more complicated and and doesn't address uh, the issue um, and so you have something that's far worse uh, even though I think HHR, HHS was really trying to help so for disclosures TPO is accepted okay uh, and there's these other exceptions though for abuse neglect or domestic violence um, you know, you don't you don't need to uh, provide it, et cetera, et cetera. So they took some exceptions away. They put some exceptions back. Um, and here's a summary of this part of it. it indicates what disclosures must be made, uh, and then it provides this other list of exceptions. There's no mention of an EHR. The three-year time period is imposed for any PHI contained in a designated uh, record set. Um, Although not obvious on its face, these proposed changes have the potential to dramatically increase the number of disclosures a CE must make. So they've eliminated the mention to, of an EHR, and here's the problem with that, is that a designated record set is defined really broad. Records maintained by or for a CE, medical records and billing records, the enrollment, payment, claims, yada, yada. It expands the amount of PHI that might be subject to uh, fulfilling a disclosure request. So for purpose of this paragraph, the term record means any item collection or group of information that includes PHI and is maintained, collected, used, or disseminated. It's really, really broad. And it's clearly more broad than what is in an EHR. So despite the fact that HHS appears to want to help, the industry resolve this problem. They just expanded potentially. Now this is the proposed rule, right? They just expanded under this proposed rule what you might have to account for and they don't really deal with this problem that we talked about before that none of this information is in the law today. Date, address, name of entity, none of this is captured today, right? So that's that problem remains. The due process requirements are consistent with other PBR sections so this um, Actually, I think they shortened it no later than 30 days after re receipt, okay? The existing rule was 60 days. So uh, the form and format it requested by the individual, uh, the first accounting for disclosures 29, uh, in a 12-month period is without charge. You, you can ask for the request in writing. These are similar to other patients' bill of rights due process, um, and they, they go with three years instead of six. And now you have this new thing which is a right to an access report okay and they attempt to limit uh, um, limit this access report only to an electronic designated record set so disclosures weren't limited at all so this is this is sort of their attempt to deal with the high tech act and uh, 13405c um, it's Access report is an entirely new right. Electronic data record set is the reference here, not an EHR. The EHR reference is completely gone. Uh, an access report does not distinguish between use and disclosure. Um, you know, so you're looking at audit logs. The context of this, remember, is you're looking at audit logs. And how do you know, how does an audit log or how does the system capture that this is a legitimate use because the nurse is looking up the patient's chart versus what got logged was a disclosure to a business associate uh, outside of the entity. The logs today don't make that kind of, um, don't distinguish on, the, on that basis, and the access report does not require, doesn't care if it's a user disclosure, uh, it gets reported. The implementation specifications are like, uh, are similar to the, the specification for disclosures, um, However, uh, limited to date, time, and person or entity description, and user action are optional. So this is HHS removing you know, the description of the PHI, the action that the user took, the purpose. All that stuff is not required in the access report. Um, so it seems clear, uh, first of all, you should understand that there is no TPO exception here. 
so this really satisfies 13405C. The access report is trying to satisfy this requirement. TPO is not accepted. It was accepted by default under the disclosure rule because they gave you a list of what you where you had to disclose and they didn't include TPO, which is really a confusing way to go about doing this just from a, a, a regulatory perspective. Um, the intent here is that EHRs can or will produce the access report via automation. However, EHRs can't do this today, therefore no technical path forward. That's essentially what the what the uh, Tiger team found. Uh, the access report requirement is considered a material change to your notice of privacy practices. So if this went into effect, you would have to change your notice of privacy practices and start distributing the new privacy practice uh, and um, because because essentially HHS said this was a material change. So Martin, are you? I've you got a question? couple questions. Okay. So, if an insurance company wants to audit records of their patients, this would be considered a disclosure. No. If if, if well. You know that it, it depends. This person may want to speak. I mean, if, if, if when you say an insurance company wants to audit its patients, I mean, is the reference to a system that the insurance company owns, or to or to records that a uh, if it's in reference to records that it doesn't have in its possession, and it ha it has the contractual right to go look at uh, the CE's records, then yes. That would be a that would be a disclosure because it, it it's it's to a it's to an outside um, party. Now I can't. I mean, this is a this is a covered entity, but it doesn't matter. Disclosures weren't limited to covered entities or business associates or, you know, I, I would think that that's a that's a disclosure. It's pretty broad. It's outside of the entity if that's the if that's the fact pattern. Okay. Can you talk about the release of third party information? This is part of the covered entity's designated record set, but not created by the CE. We receive many requests for disclosures, disclosure of this information to external agencies. We have developed policy that we will be provide this if this is required for service eligibility, but typically assist them in going to the source for the information. What are your thoughts? Again, you go back to first principles. If you're providing information, uh, PHI, to an, an entity that's outside of the entity in which it's contained, presumably where you work, uh, your employer, then that's a disclosure, right? That's just a disclosure, and you have to, you would have to then provide the name of the person that it went to, the purpose, it's yada yada yada, right? All that, and which is why it, it's going to remain a manual process until it's somehow fixed. Okay, uh, and you know, it, yes, if it's in the designated record set under the proposed rule, you would have to disclose it absolutely, because now HHS has broadened you know the, the definition to what's in the designated record set, and the DRS is so broadly defined that it could have it could be PHI on on a fold on a file folder on a server. I mean, it, it's just so much broader than what is in. Uh, you know, in EHR, and I think HHS was actually trying to do a good thing, saying, well, we'll just narrow it down to this, but I think that narrowing down in practice really potentially explodes the amount of PHI that would need to be disclosed. I'm out of questions. Okay, so here's what the Tiger team said. We'll go through this real quick, and then we'll have a little bit more Q&A. Um, this was December 2013, so just a few months ago. Um, industry thought leaders, chaired by Devin McGraw and, and Paul Eggerman, and they reported out and they had the following recommendations. First of all, they essentially said HHS should really slow down, approach this in a stepwise fashion. Uh, they don't believe that the proposed access report meets the requirements of the High Tech Act, uh, and specifically they cite that it doesn't meet the requirements of account for the interest of the patient and the burden. So they, uh, although they don't highlight designated record set and, and, you know, those are sort of my sort of insights, 
they 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 were unhappy with uh, the fact that uh, it, that this access report approach struck the right balance. Now they so they they want a quality over quantity approach. It, it's they're not clear really as to what they mean by quality over quantity. This might be some reference to the fact that there's not that many disclosures that happen today. So that if you got one or two and you had to go about you had to, you had to go about gathering all this manual data, that at least you gathered that manual data in some comprehensive way and provided something to the patient that was meaningful instead of some automated access report that had a bunch of junk, uh, you know, and it had a hundred disclosures, but it it was just in a form that didn't mean anything. I think that that's what they're getting to, but that that's premised on the fact that uh, that the requirement for disclosures won't grow. So I, you know, this is this is a little um, perhaps a little just mumbo jumbo a way to hide a a, a concern quality over quantity. Uh, HHS should pursue follow the data approach when. Control of patient data is transferred to another entity. The recipient of the data should be part of the accounting for disclosures. I mean, that's what just accounting for disclosures is. If it goes outside of the entity, then you have to disclose it. Okay, and it doesn't matter where it went. It doesn't matter if it went to a business associate. And if a business associate transfers it to a sub, then that has to be reported, right? So follow the data is the right approach, but I think it's sort of redundant because I think follow the data is what happens today. Uh, but here's the real thing. They they requested or recommended it should be piloted. So they're pushing back on, on HHS, and right rightfully so in, in, in the sense that there are no EHRs today that really do this. And so, you know, there is no, uh, there are no technical solutions. So, um, and specifically they go on to say in Recommendation 5, it's, uh, it should require only an entity key name, not the name of an individual. Uh, and again, the content of the report should be tested in the pilot. And four is the entire feasibility should be tested in the pilot. Um, they do reinforce that this is an important right, but that's that's kind of motherhood and apple pie. They really don't have any choice but to acknowledge that it's an important right because it's the law. So it's, it would be hard to argue that, that this should go away entirely, uh, although I suppose they could. And then they, they have two addressable um, implementations, uh, two modifications to the security rule, uh, technical safeguards. These are their recommendations that you add to addressable implementation specifications. Audit controls must record PHI access activities to the granularity of the user and the individual whose PHI is being accessed. This is trying to get at, hey, provide, make it a requirement or an addressable requirement at the minimum to capture the information that the at the granularity that we need it so that we can report it. Um, and the second one is information recorded by the audit controls must be sufficient to support the information system activity review required by this section of the administrative safeguards. Um, and again, this is just provide the necessary information that we need to report out is, is, is what they're getting at. I'm a little surprised that they make these addressable and not um, and not required um, so um, the tea leaves well let me stop are there any other questions yes who makes up the tiger team you know I could get you a list but it was a, 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 a I, I think it was a uh, mostly uh, industry thought leaders people that were uh, well-known in uh, privacy and security and from the private sector. I think this was private sector input because this, because the because the industry pushed back so hard. And so, you know, uh, like any good government agency, you, you know, you then form a committee to get more feedback. And that's, that's essentially what happened. You know, uh, it's my understanding that the Tiger team was sort of, you know, industry luminaries that, uh, that could be counted on, you know, that provides something reasonable, some reasonable recommendations. Is there a way to find out what the Tiger team is working on? No, this is it. <laughs> this is it. The I, I believe this report out was it. Uh, HHS, remember now, this is a little history. They came out with the proposed rule in 2010. We're now in 2014. And I don't think, um, I mean, that's what we're going to get to next, but 
this is the High Tech Act is the law. So you know, essentially, um, from my perspective, what uh, the Tiger team did was um, sort of asked um, HHS to punt, to study it further. You know, just don't do anything right now. But I don't believe that HHS has the luxury to completely punt. And uh, you know, you're going to see this integration of the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification, I mean all these things coming together and you know one place that they come together is in accounting for disclosures. Uh, so the main recommendation from the Tiger team, and there are no further action items for this particular Tiger team that I'm aware of. It's not like they, they've gone back to study. They did their thing, they came up with the recommendation, and now the ball's back in HHS's court and you know it, it's, it's long overdue to say the least. And so I don't think um, uh, you know, essentially, the, the, it, it, you know, it said, hey, study it some more. And this is really industry speak for delay, delay, delay. Now, I have to agree that, you know, maybe delaying, uh, it, it, certainly delaying is better than proposing something that's going to have huge negative unintended consequences for a problem that may not even exist, given the fact that the amount of disclosures have been neg negligible heretofore, right? So that's that's sort of the dilemma, but here's the problem that HHS has. It, it, it's long overdue. High tech is already law. HHS probably can't punt, and therefore it'll likely focus on EHRs, and it may back off from this access report, and it may go back to focusing on EHRs and um, maybe forgetting this whole designated record set thing that uh, you know that was their attempt to sort of limit the scope. And I think they're going to have to. Um, they, they probably they can't eliminate the requirement to, so so that we understand the requirements there today under 164.528. The requirement was modified by the High Tech Act, so it's law that if you have an EHR, blah blah blah, you got a you got the TPO exception has been blown up. So this is the you know this is the no man's land that we're in. It is law today, although HHS is probably not going to enforce it themselves. You know, it, that's not to say that it wouldn't be enforced. That's not to say that you couldn't have a, a, a lot of patients make requests and, you know, then what do you do? You don't have any guidance from HHS, but it's the law. You're going to have to cope with this animal, this beast, uh, the best way that you can. And hopefully you don't get those 100 requests um, in one month. Uh, that scenario doesn't happen uh, just because patients aren't ready for it, aren't asking for it. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a disservice in many ways that HHS does by, you know, uh, delaying uh, either coming up with interim rules that most people don't realize that the interim rule is the rule, and even though the final rule hasn't come out. In this case, there's not even an interim rule, but I believe HHS is probably going to um, be forced to come up with some compromise uh, soon. So you're going to have to watch. Uh, this space closely just to figure out where it's gone. Okay, so that's just a little. Right now, the best we can do is is, is provide some education regarding what the what the current rule was is 164.528. That's still law. How the uh, High Tech Act modified it. That's law. And wait for some guidance from HHS as to uh, how they recommend actually. Uh, satisfying High Tech Act 13405C in in the form of a modified regulation. So uh, we're going to end. Most of you know we have the Hip Survivor Guide store where we have uh, a subscription plan and other products that can help you. Uh, we believe we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients and give you products that you can execute starting day one. So with that, I'll. You know, I'm going to wrap it up. If there's any other questions, we can take them now. Um, who determines what the timer team, I'm sorry, Tiger team works on? I think this Tiger team in, in, in this particular case was a, 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 uh, a call, uh, a request by HHS to some industry thought leaders to study this particular issue. Now there are other tiger teams. That's just a, a a term that's used, right? SWAT team, tiger team, uh, that are used to study different problems. But it's generally not the same players, right? Because depending on the problem, HHS is going to select 
particular individuals with particular backgrounds and experience, et cetera, et cetera. So I think HHS, uh, as a way to deal with the industry's pushback, you know, recommended uh, the creation. And I'm, I'm ad-libbing here as to, as to the process. I actually don't track that part of the sausage making that much to tell you exactly how it came about, but I know that it came about because the industry pushed back really hard and for good reason, and then this was a step that HHS took and said, okay, well, you guys look at the problem and then give us, give us your report given what we've proposed. And I think their work is complete, so the ball is now back in HHS's court, and it remains to be seen what that final rule will look like, and I think they don't really have the luxury to keep kicking the can down the road. So, I, you know, it's, I, I mean, I, I could follow up on that, but as far as I know, that the work of this Tiger team, these individuals, I think it's done. They report it out. Okay. My company provides services for people with developmental disabilities. Pennsylvania requires documentation in a state-mandated, web-based, secure system. My company does not control the web-based system and find it challenging to do, obtain any requested reports from the system. Any recommendations on how to accomplish a request for an accounting from a customer on their, uh, of their, fa of their or their family in this system? No, I have no idea of that Pennsylvania law, and so um, you know, I, I really, I, you know, obviously you have to, you have to. Well, not obviously. <laughs> if the state laws are more stringent, require more than HIPAA, then you have to comply with HIPAA and the state law. Um, generally, it's going to be, you know, a, like for example, a, a state law. If HIPAA says you have to provide this accounting for disclosure in 30 days, and the state law says you have to com you have to provide it in 15 days, then you have to provide it in 15 days because the state law is more stringent. So. Uh, I, I'm not really aware of this particular uh, system in, Pens in Pennsylvania, so I'm not sure um, how to answer that question. We don't have any more questions at this point. All right. Well, great. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for listening, and um, see you next week.